Hello everybody and thank you for joining us for this webinar today on the low vision accessibility features of Windows 10 version 2004. Uh, my name is Luke Scriven. I am an assistive technology specialist with Vision Forward. And for those of you who don't know about Vision Forward, we are a nonprofit in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, who serve the needs of people who are blind or visually impaired. And our mission is to empower, educate, and enhance the lives of individuals impacted by vision loss through all of life's transitions. And in order to do that, we have a number of different programs, such as assistive technology, orientation and mobility, occupational therapy, uh, counseling, a low vision clinic, and so on and so forth. And if you are interested in our organization, you can visit our website, vision forward.org. Now I have a few um, things to tell you before we really get started with the webinar. Uh, first of all, in the intro music there, it said if you had questions, you could put them in the chat. But actually for this webinar, we're going to be putting things into the Q&A. And so you should find the Q&A uh, down toward the bottom of the screen. If you do have questions, please feel free to put them in there. And uh, I will take questions as we go along if there are any. So uh, feel free to drop anything in there. Um, after 24, like 24 hours after this webinar, you will receive a questionnaire which you can fill out and uh, then you will be able to get your ACV REP credit. But if you do want to do that before the 24 hours, you can go to vision-forward.org forward slash webinars and you will find the questionnaire there as well. We also there have links to previous webinars as well as our uh, previous Tech Talk live events, which are live assistive technology demonstrations that we hold every other Thursday. And those are actually eligible for ACV RVP credit as well. And so um, if you're interested in looking at those, you can also earn credits for them or you can just watch them and enjoy them and, uh, you know, not bother with the credits. So that's always an option. And talking of ACV REP credits, our entrance word today is going to be Bill, B-I-L-L. -L. And you should find that in the chat. Uh, my colleague Corey should be typing it in there for us. And also, he should also be putting in the, uh, the websites that I've given you as well. So our objectives for today's webinar are going to be uh, learning all about Windows 10 accessibility features for people with low vision. So we're going to be learning how to access those features. We're going to be demonstrating what each of the features does. And we're going to be discussing the scenarios in which each of those features might be useful. And Windows 10 really does have some quite good accessibility features for people with low vision now. Uh, I, I feel like they were behind for quite a while compared to Apple in terms of what they were offering. Uh, but they've really improved that a lot recently. And in the latest update in particular, there have been some really nice uh, some really nice additions which uh, are, are very useful. So we're going to be taking a look at those and I think for a lot of people now the accessibility features built into Windows 10 are compa comparable to software that previously you might have had to pay for, for like uh, Zoom text for example and uh, obviously they're free because they're built into the operating system so there's a lot of uh, a lot of benefit to be had. So first of all, how do we go about accessing the accessibility features? And uh, there's, a, there's a few ways that we can do this, but we will find those features under ease of access in our settings. But the way that I prefer to get to them is just hit the Windows key to bring up the search box and type in vision and then press enter. And that's going to take us right through to the vision accessibility uh, options that we have in Windows 10. And when we get through to that screen, which we'll, we will be taking a look at, we'll see that the categories for vision are listed on the left. And those should include display, mouse pointer, text cursor, magnifier, color filters, 
high contrast and narrator. So there's quite a few different things that we're able to change. And when you select a category from the left, then the options that we can use to manipulate that category will be shown on the right. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at uh, all of this stuff. Now, the only thing that we won't be discussing today in detail is going to be the color filters, because those are primarily for people with uh, color blindness and not so relevant to low vision for the most part. And also narrator, um, that's a screen reader primarily geared toward people who are blind. And we're mostly focusing on the low vision aspects in this webinar. Although in the future, we may do a webinar on narrator or other screen readers. Now, if you don't see all of the categories as I just listed them, so display, mouse pointer, text cursor, magnifier, color filters, high contrast, and narrator, if you don't see those listed in exactly that way, then it might be that you aren't actually updated to Windows version 2004. So uh, we have obviously Windows 10, but Windows 10 has got its own versions because they are continuously updating it. And in the latest update, that's when we got some additional accessibility features, which are very worth having. So if you don't see all of the categories, as I listed there, then you might want to check the version of Windows 10 that you're currently running. And to do that, you could open up the search bar with the Windows key and type in about your PC. And when you bring up that window, you can then scroll down and find out what version you're currently running. And if you're not running version 2004, then you might have to check for updates, which you can do by opening up the search box and typing in updates. It's a bit of a weird one with version 2004 because for some reason it didn't automatically install for a lot of people. With Windows 10, mostly Microsoft were looking to make updates uh, install automatically because it's easier for them to support. Uh, but with this 2004 update, that didn't really seem to happen for a lot of people. And so if you go into your updates, you might see it just sitting there waiting for you to click on a button to tell it to start downloading. And the download is quite large. It's quite a large update. So depending on your internet speed, it might take a couple of hours uh, to download that update. Once it's downloaded, then you'll have to restart your computer, at which point then it will start to install the update. And again, that's a fairly lengthy process, but well worth doing uh, because of the additional features it gives for accessibility, which we will be discussing uh, as we go through. So with that being said, let's get on to uh, the ease of access settings and what they all do. And we're going to start off with display. And on the slide here, we have an image of what the ease of access settings window looks like. Now we're actually gonna be switching over and taking a look at this window uh, uh, live, but here's a picture just to give you an idea. So on the left here, uh, we have selected display. And on the right, we have all the things that we can change about the display. And there's quite a lot. There's, there's two slides worth of things which we're able to change about the display. Uh, but I think there's just a couple which are probably the most important options. And one of those is make text bigger. And this is going to change the size of text across Microsoft, Microsoft programs. So, uh, you know, the Microsoft Edge browser and Microsoft Office Suite and uh, settings uh, within Windows and so on and so forth. But it also enlarges the ribbons. And those of you familiar with the Microsoft Office Suite should be familiar with the ribbons, those menus that we get at the top of Word and Excel and PowerPoint and so on and so forth. So making the text bigger within the ease of access settings will actually make those larger, uh, which can be really nice because other ways of magnifying don't necessarily affect those in the same way. So for example, if we're typing in Word, and we make the font larger so that it's easier for us to see as we type, that won't affect the size of the ribbons. And so it can still be hard to see those, uh, but we can adjust those in our ease of access settings. We're gonna take a look at that in just a second. Uh, but the other important option I think under display is make everything bigger. And this essentially seems to change the screen resolution. So literally everything will become bigger, the icons on the desktop, 
um, the taskbar, um, you know, everything, uh, which is nice. However, it does cause some problems. For example, uh, it seems to especially be the case with pop-up windows. If you've made everything too large, you may get pop-up windows coming up and the button to close them can be off the screen uh, because everything's so big. And so then you have a, you know, a lot of trouble trying to close those windows and it can be a little bit confusing. But let's jump across now to our ease of access settings here. So we'll see if we can find those, here we go. And this is what our ease of access settings looks like. And we're currently in our display settings. And here's make text bigger, which I discussed. So we're gonna go ahead and give this a try and see what it does. So we have a slider, as we move it to the right, it will make the text larger. And there's some sample text above the slider, which lets us know kind of how large we're making things. So I'm gonna move that slider to the right. And we're gonna put it at its maximum size, 225%, and we'll hit apply. And we should see in just a couple of seconds that all of the words within the, uh, the the menu here are much larger. So we can start to get an idea of what this does. Now I had told you that this also changes the size of things like the ribbon as well. And so if I switch over to my Microsoft Word document here, and we should be able to see here the ribbon at the top of the screen has become much, much larger. And so it's going to be easier to have access to those important functions like font type and font size and bold italic underline uh, and so on and so forth. All of those things which we, uh, which we want to be able to access easily. You can also see here, though, one of the downsides to doing this. If we look at the tabs across the very top here, home, insert, uh, draw, design, layout, references, and so on and so forth, we will see that because the font of those is so much larger, they don't fit anymore in the space that they have. And so those words are cut off, uh, making them, you know, it's it, making it harder to understand what they are. Now, for a lot of people, that probably won't matter too much, especially just a casual user who may not be using a lot of that stuff. Uh, but that does highlight one of the issues with making things larger. Sometimes it can cause some issues in terms of uh, in terms of display. Well, let's jump back to our ease of access settings menu here. We're going to make our text smaller again. We'll go to 125%. I'll hit apply. And now it's gone ahead and changed it back again. Now, the other option which I'd said is important is make everything bigger. And as I said, this literally makes everything bigger, just like it says, but it can cause some display issues again. And so I don't necessarily like messing around with that unless I have to. Um, if you put it up to 125%, it can be um, it can be okay, but if you get beyond that, it can start to cause some issues. So I'm not going to mess around with that at the moment. We'll just take a look at what other options we have here. We can change the uh, display brightness, and um, so that can be can be handy. And we can also make the way that Windows looks a little simpler in terms of animations and things like that, just to make it a bit more visually accessible and less confusing. I don't know that, that many people would need to mess around with those options, though. So let's jump back across to our PowerPoints here, and we'll take a look what the next option that we have is in ease of access, and that would be the mouse pointer. Now, this has been something which I have wanted in Windows for a long time, the ability to more effectively change the size of the mouse pointer. Previously, there was a so-called extra large scheme, but uh, it really wasn't very large at all. And so um, I never found that to be very good, but now we have a lot better flexibility in terms of how we adjust the mouse pointer to make it more visible. And the most important options, I think, for the mouse pointer will be change pointer size and color. We have a slider that allows us to change the size of the pointer. And we can also change the color of the pointer, either choosing from some preset colors or by creating our own color. One thing to be aware of with this though, is if we make the mouse pointer very large, 
And then we also use the built-in magnifier, which we'll be looking at a little later. Uh, we have to remember that as we magnify, we're also making the mouse pointer larger just by doing that because we're zooming in on it. And so we could end up with a situation where we've made the mouse pointer as large as it can be. And then we've also zoomed in and now the mouse pointer is taking up almost the entire screen. So you do have to be a little bit careful and just kind of balance things out and figure out what works the best for the user. Let's jump across to our ease of access settings again, and we'll click on mouse pointer. And here we have the options, not, uh, not too many here, but just the important things. So we have the slider, as I said, to adjust the mouse pointer side, size. As we move it to the right, the pointer will get larger and larger. Really nice maximum size, it's, it's very nice and large. And to the left, we'll see how small we can get it. And we can get it uh, very small as well, extra, extra small there. Um, Underneath there is the options for the colors. And so we have a nice high contrast white uh, with a bold black outline. We have a nice high contrast black with a white outline. We also have inverted. And with this one, as we move it over a white area, it will be dark. As we move it over a dark area, it will be white. And then we also have the option to choose other colors. And so I quite like the yellow, but uh, there's a number of suggested colors here, some purples and blues and greens and so on. Or we can actually pick a custom color. And so we can basically have any color of the rainbow, whatever color looks the best for ourselves or our clients or whoever is using the computer. So there's really quite a lot of good flexibility there uh, with the mouse pointer, and it's very easy to uh, to set it up. So I'm very pleased to see that. Now, this wasn't in the 2004 update. This was actually before that. Um, so uh, even if you haven't got the 2004 update, you should still have access to this setting. And underneath there, we can see we can also, for touchscreen users, uh, change the way that things look. And so we can make it more obvious where we've touched and we can also make it more obvious where we can touch. And so there's some, a couple of things that we can change there if we want to. Let's go back to our PowerPoint now and we'll move on to the next option in the ease of access settings. And that's going to be our text cursor. Now this was an addition in the 2004 update. So you do need the 2004 update in order to, uh, to change this. And what it's gonna do is make our cursor much easier to see. So as we're typing, we're not gonna have as much trouble locating that. The most important options I think here are using the text cursor indicator. So we have to turn it on manually and then uh, a slider will allow us to change the size of the indicators and we can also change the color of them. The text cursor indicators are basically colored blobs above and below the text cursor, which can help you more easily find where it is. We'll be looking at that in just a second. We can also change the text cursor thickness. We could do this before. And uh, so the text cursor by default is a thin flashing line. We can make that much thicker if we want to. I always found though, it gets a little confusing when it's thicker. Um, it can be hard to tell exactly where it is when it's, when it's too large. So let's switch back here to our ease of access settings and we will go to text cursor and we'll see what this does here. So first of all, we have a button to turn on the text cursor indicator. Let's go ahead and do that. Underneath there, we have a box uh, which will show us what the text in a uh, cursor indicator is going to look like. I have it set to its maximum size and we have these two purple blobs, one above and one below the cursor. Let's just use the slider here to change the size of those and we'll see them changing in real time. So we can have them real small or we can have them real large. Let's go for real large for the moment and I'll switch to my Word document. And we can see the cursor is here at the start of the document and we have these purple uh, kind of almost triangles of color above and below it. And obviously as the cursor moves, those will move along with it. It is a little bit of a shame that we can't uh, make those even bigger or maybe even change the shape of them and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's not a bad start at all. And it definitely does make that cursor easier to see. And again, we have options in terms of changing the color of those. So there's a number of preset colors we can choose from. 
or again, we could create our own custom color, whatever looks best for us. Underneath there, we have the option to change the text cursor appearance. We can make it thicker by moving the slider to the right. Let's give that a try here. We'll make it nice and thick. Let me turn off the text cursor indicators for a second, although you can have both on at the same time. And now the text cursor is very large. It's like a flashing black square. And again, it obviously it will move as we type. I find it a little confusing if we have to go back and make edits. It can be confusing knowing where the start of the cursor and the end of the cursor are. And so that's why I'm not a massive fan of making it this thick. Uh, but the option is there if you, if you want it. Let's now move back to our PowerPoint. And we'll take a look at the next feature, which is the magnifier. Now the magnifier is going to be the main uh, feature, which you know people will use most likely depending on the individual, but it's definitely one of the most useful accessibility features for low vision. And using the magnifier, we can obviously magnify things. It's all in the name there. Uh, so let's take a look at that. We have two slides here showing the options for the magnifier because there's quite a lot that you're able to change with the magnifier. So that leads us to the question, well, what's the most important things that uh, we can change there? And I'm going to say none of them. Uh, being a little bit facetious there, but it is a lot easier, uh, more efficient to learn to use the keyboard shortcuts to control the magnifier. Because if you imagine you want to zoom in, every time you want to zoom in, you've got to go to the settings menu and press the button to zoom in. Every time you want to zoom out, you have to do the same. Every time you want to turn on the magnifier, you have to do the same. It's going to get quite old quite fast and be more difficult ultimately than just remembering a few keyboard shortcuts. So I definitely encourage uh, that. And we'll look at, look at those shortcuts in just a second. But there are two things in the ease of access settings for the magnifier, which we do have to change in those settings. And that's the lens size. So we can use the magnifier in lens mode, which we'll be looking at. And if we want to adjust the size of the lens, we have to do that in the ease of access settings. We can there adjust the horizontal and vertical size of that lens. And the other thing we have to do there, if we want to change it, is change the modifier key that we use when having text read aloud. So the magnifier does have a text uh, re uh, reading feature. And by default, the modifier keys for that are Control and Alt. We can change those if we want in the ease of access settings. So let's jump across there now and take a look at that. So we're now in our ease of access settings menu. We'll go to magnifier and we have here a switch to turn on the magnifier, but uh, we can do that by holding windows and pressing plus. So that's the way that I would do it. We can change zoom level, but again, we can do that with windows and plus and windows and minus. So that's the way I would do that. We can choose to start the magnifier after we sign in. And again, it's not entirely necessary because if we know Windows Plus turns on the magnifier, it's very easy for us to get it started whenever we turn on the computer anyway. We can invert the colors. And, uh, but uh, again, we can do that with the keyboard shortcut, Control-Alt-I. We can change the magnifier view and uh, with this drop-down box here. But again, we can do that with keyboard shortcuts. Um, there's a couple of options down here in terms of focusing. I would just generally leave those as they are because I think they're set to uh, the best settings anyway. One thing you might want to change though is uh, the way that the mouse pointer works. When we're in full screen magnification, uh, which we'll look at as we move the mouse pointer, it will pan the screen. We can set that so that the mouse always stays in the center of the screen, even when we're panning if we want to. And then finally at the bottom here, we can uh, go ahead and change the modifier key that we use when we're having the magnifier read to us. Let me just pan up here a second. I'm just gonna change this in the drop down box to lens view, just so I can show you here. When we're in lens view in the settings menu here, we can change the size and shape of the lens with the horizontal and vertical sliders. And we'll see that reflected in the size and shape of this blue box here. So if I just switch back to the PowerPoint, I do have these shortcuts for the magnifier here in a table, and they're not too hard. Windows Plus will turn on the magnifier, and then every subsequent use of Windows Plus will zoom in. 
Windows minus will zoom out and Windows escape will turn off the magnifier. And then control alt I to invert the colors, control alt M to switch between magnifier modes. And we can also use control alt plus the first letter of the magnifier mode. So for example, control alt F for full screen mode, control alt uh, L for lens mode and so on and so forth. And control alt left click will start to read from wherever we clicked. Let's see this in action now. So we're going to go, I think I have a uh, web page open here. Here we go. So here, here we have a web page. Uh, this is a, a new story. So we have some text and we also have some pictures. First of all, let's turn on the magnifier. I'll hold down Windows and press the plus. The first time I do that, it's turned on the magnifier, but it's not actually magnifying. So we're at one times magnification. Everything is still the same size. We're going to do Windows Plus again. And each time we do it again, we're going to zoom in more. Now, currently, we're in the lens magnification mode. And in this mode, it's kind of like moving a magnifying glass over the screen. The benefit to this is we can still get an idea of, of what the page looks like normally. So it can help us kind of understand where we are on the page. Uh, when we do full screen zoom, which we'll look at in just a second, because we zoom in on everything, it can get a bit confusing knowing where you are on the on the web page. If I do Windows minus, it will zoom out. And the other thing I can do, which is useful, is Control Alt I, and that will invert the colors within the magnifier. And so whites will become white, uh, black, and blacks will become white. And for some people, that's uh, a lot easier to read. Control Alt I again, we'll go ahead and turn that off. So I'm going to now switch over to the full screen mode. And in order to do that, we're going to do Control Alt and F for full screen. And so this is the other main magnifier mode. And in this mode, it's nice because we get the whole screen magnified, but it can be confusing, as I said, knowing where we are on the page. And in order to pan, we have to move the mouse up, down, uh, left or right, and it kind of pushes the screen around. Some people just can't really get the hang of that. So for them, the lens magnifier mode might be more appropriate. And let me just show you something with the invert that I looked at before. So for reading text, the invert colors is really good. Um, it makes them, uh, you know, it makes text read easier to read for a lot of people. But when it comes to pictures, not so good because it's inverting all the colors of the pictures as well. And so this picture, which was all greens before, uh, is now all purple. And it's really, really hard to tell what it's supposed to be. So we do have to get used to that Control Alt I command to toggle on and off invert colors um, if we want to get the most out of it. And so there is a little bit of kind of learning with this stuff. Uh, but ultimately, as I say, the keyboard shortcuts are a lot easier to, uh, to, to use. Now, there is one more magnifier feature that we haven't looked at yet. That's the ability to have text read aloud to us. And this was an update uh, in the 2004 um, edition. And it's really, really useful and really powerful. So anywhere that there's text, we're now able to have that text read aloud by the Windows magnifier, whether it be uh, an email, a Word document, an icon on the desktop, or a web page, as we have here any of those things we can have read aloud to us. Let's see how that works here. So let's say that we want to read from the first word here, the word there. We're going to hold down Control Alt and left click on that word. There is no path through the jungle. Every step requires navigation, winding around a tree, stepping over a root, ducking under. And we can stop that with any key. And hopefully you could hear that the quality of the voice is pretty good. It started reading instantaneously. And uh, it also highlights as it reads. And if we're magnified, it will move the screen along as it reads so we can keep track of where it's reading. Uh, this is a really, really powerful feature that previously you could only really get with dedicated um, assistive technology software. So it's really nice to see it built into Windows 10 here. Now. What you have to remember is that this feature will work even if we're not magnified. So here we are at one times magnification, but we do have to have the magnifier turned on. And so even though we're 
at we're not magnifying at the moment the magnifier is still turned on at the moment we're just at one times magnification so we would be able to use the read aloud feature at the moment if we wanted to there is no path through the jungle every step and so on and so forth but if the magnifier is not turned on we can't use this feature and that has caught me out a couple of times when i've tried to have something read and it just hasn't worked um, but uh, that's because the magnifier wasn't turned on so we do need to remember to turn on the magnifier to get that to work and uh, if we want to change the voice and the voice speed we are able to do that from the magnifier control panel here there's a settings wheel on the right and if we hit that, we have a slider for speed, and we also have a drop down box for the voice. Let's go ahead and speed up the voice here. Let's see what it sounds like at 200 times. And we'll change the voice to Microsoft Sierra. Let's see what she sounds like here. Okay, so we can get that quite fast, as, uh, <laughs> as you probably noticed there. Um, yeah, even for a uh, a uh, experienced screen reader user. I think that's a pretty good speed. Uh, let's change that back to regular speed and let's see what this voice sounds like at this speed. There is no path through the jungle. Every step requires navigation. And so on and so forth. I think there's around six voices to choose from, three male and three female. Um, yeah, so a great feature and uh, for free. It's built into Windows, so why not use it? Let's turn off the magnifier for the moment. And we're going to go back to our PowerPoint here. OK, um, I think this is the final option that we're going to look at in the ease of access settings. And this is high contrast. High contrast is going to be fairly similar to uh, the invert colors that we just looked at with the magnifier. But it's a little bit better, I think. And the most important options we have here are choosing a theme. And so we have essentially high contrast black and high contrast white. And then we have options to customize exactly what those are going to look like. Now, there is a keyboard shortcut also for, um, for this feature, which is going to be Alt, Left, Shift, and print screen and again if you do want to use high contrast i would recommend memorizing that because sometimes you might want to turn off high contrast there's certain areas it doesn't work too great on certain web pages in particular that just don't look correct with the high contrast on so let's move to our ease of access settings and just look at what that looks like and so here we are with the options for high contrast there's a button here we can press to turn it on and off. Let me go ahead. Uh, as I said, there is a keyboard shortcut for this as well. Alt, left, shift, and print screen. But let's go ahead and hit the button here to turn it on. It takes a second to apply. OK, and now it's turned on the high contrast mode. And I have the white uh, on black, which is called high contrast black set here. Underneath the drop down box, uh, well, actually, first of all, in the drop down box, we can choose the theme that we want. And there's a few to choose from high contrast black and high contrast white being uh, the most important ones there, I think. I'm going to leave it on black at the moment. And underneath the drop down, we have uh, options to further customize exactly what this looks like. So we could change the color of text from white to a different color, say yellow. We can change the color of hyperlinks. Uh, of disabled text on web pages of text that we've selected and so on and so forth. So we can very much customize these to exactly what works the best for us. And it's a very high contrast, uh, but also it's smart in the sense that it won't change the color of other things. So we saw we had a picture on a web page that we were looking at previously. With the magnifiers invert colors, it inverted the colors of the picture on the web page as well and it looks really quite bad with the high contrast mode it's a lot smarter than that and so if we go to that same web page and now we can see that uh, we do have the black background with the white text very nice and sharp but underneath with that picture the picture is still its normal colors and so it has not changed the colors of the picture uh, so that's you know a much more effective method of inverting colors 
if I go to my desktop here, then we'll see it's the same type of deal. The background is black. The icons have got really nice high contrast white text, but the colors of the icons have remained their normal colors. Those haven't been changed. And so in terms of high contrast, this works really great. One slight warning, sometimes it can mess with some uh, display settings. One time I turned on high contrast and when I turned it off again, all of my icons had been moved and you couldn't drag them close to each other anymore. They, it was almost like they were repelling each other. Uh, it took a little bit of sorting out. So there can be some issues, but in general, um, it's going to work pretty seamlessly. Let's go ahead and turn that off for the moment. Okay, give this a second and hopefully we'll get back our regular colors. Hey Luke, we do have a question that popped in here about the okay. high contrast mode. Oh. Uh, we have uh, Mira, Mira is asking, does it automatically work for other programs such as Teams when you do high contrast mode? Yeah, so it depends on the programs. It will work seamlessly across any Microsoft programs, um, but uh, there may be uh, issues with other programs. And so really you just have to try it and uh, see the results that you get. And it's very easy to to do that. So, so yeah, it's uh, it's definitely not a hundred percent applicable across everything, but definitely for Microsoft uh, software, it works very well. Okay, so we're back to our PowerPoint, and as I said, we have reached the end of the ease of access. Um, uh, you know, settings, but there are other accessibility features built in which are not found in ease of access. And a lot of these are in the form of dictation and voice control features. And there's actually a little, uh, a little bit of a confusing array of uh, options now when it comes to speech input, uh, which is, you know, it's nice to have options, but also it can be a little bit confusing. Um, so let's talk about dictation, first of all. And this now comes as a standard option in uh, if you have up-to-date Microsoft Office programs or if you're a subscriber to Office 365, you may have noticed that you have a dictate button now, which is found to the far right of the home tab uh, of the ribbon. Let's go ahead and move to our Word document again, if we can find it here, here we go. Okay, so here is our Word document and over on the right hand side we have the dictate button and it's a nice large uh, microphone. Underneath we have an uh, arrow which we can click on which will open up different languages which we're able to choose for dictation. I have mine set to English United Kingdom for obvious reasons but there's quite a few languages there that we can choose. So dictating using this is as simple as pressing on the microphone button saying what we want and then pressing on the microphone button again to stop it listening. So let's give it a try here. Hello, my name is Luke, comma, and I am having a very nice day, period. And so when we pressed it, we got a chime letting us know that we uh, that it was now listening. And then we said what we wanted to say. When we turned it off, we got another chime. And it's typed to that really well. We've got, hello, my name is Luke Gomer, and I am having a very nice day, period. So that has worked uh, absolutely perfectly. Now, this is an online dictation. So you do have to be connected to the internet for this dictation to work. Something just worth bearing in mind. In general, it seems to do a really nice job. Although I have found occasionally it does strange things like uh, it will make spelling mistakes, which I don't think should be possible because <laughs> it's, a, it's an artificial intelligence and not a real person. But anyway, there we go. Sometimes it makes spelling mistakes. Sometimes it does strange things like uh, it will not put space between words um, or you'll say some punctuation and it won't uh, and it will just type the word like period, uh, period for example but uh, in general it does a nice job now one thing to remember when you are showing people dictation features is dictation is an entirely different skill set to typing or talking the reason being that you need to talk as if you're writing and not as if you're conversing with somebody. And it's really weird to get used to that. You really have to think about what you're going to say before you say it. And you also need to make sure that you put the punctuation in there by speaking the punctuation aloud, comma, period, exclamation mark, 
new line, new paragraph, and so on and so forth. And so it does re require an entirely different skill set. I've definitely had some very interesting emails from clients first learning to use dictation, um, which don't make a lot of sense because they haven't really thought about what they're doing. And they've just, you know, been saying, um, ah, uh, and then not enunciating very well or whatever. And uh, so it does take a bit of practice, I think, to get the best results out of dictation. Let's go ahead and switch back to our PowerPoint a second, because at the bottom of this slide, we'll see there is another way to dictate. And that's using the command Windows H. And using Windows H will uh, allow us to dictate in any text field or anywhere where we can type, we can dictate using Windows H. This is why I said it's a little confusing, because we can do this within any of our Microsoft Office programs instead of using the dictate button. We can use Windows H instead. Let's give it a try here. Again, we'll press Windows H. We'll hear a noise to let us know it's listening. And we'll dictate, and then we'll press Windows H to stop it listening. So let's give this a try. Hello, my name is Luke, comma, and I am having a very nice day, period. OK, now this one was interesting, and it does highlight something that I was saying before. So we have, hello, my name is Luke, but Luke is spelled L-U-C, which is more of the, the French spelling. So maybe this one's a bit more French. And uh, it says, I'm having a very nice day, period. It's written out the word period rather than using the punctuation mark. So a little bit strange. Um, you would have thought these would be using the same dictation engine, but who knows. Uh, but again, this is an online dictation. So we do need to be connected to the internet, as far as I know, to uh, make this work. Now, the benefit to the Windows H command is that it will work in any text field, as I said. So it's not just the Microsoft Office programs. It works anywhere that we might want to type. So for example, if I go to the search bar here, and I could dictate something in here with Windows H. Monkeys. And there we go. So I've dictated the word monkeys, and it's found a result for us on the internet, uh, which I will have to check out later. So that's that. If we go to an internet page here, uh, then we can go ahead and do the same thing here. Vision forward. And uh, we dictated what we want. And again, it's typed into the search bar. So it's really flexible. Anywhere that we could normally type, we can go ahead and dictate instead, which is a, a really nice little feature to have, bearing in mind all the things I said before in terms of good enunciation, thinking about what you want to say before you say it, and so on and so forth. So I think some people have the impression that dictation is, is the answer for those people who aren't able to type very well. But that's not always the case. It does require sufficient training to, to get good at it. Let's go back to our PowerPoint here. OK, now the other form of dictation we have is a speech recognition service. And this one is a little bit different. Number one, it's offline, so we don't have to be connected to the internet. Uh, the downside to that is that it doesn't have all of these voice samples to work from. So with the online, when people use it, uh, voice data gets you know, sent to Microsoft servers, and that can help improve the recognition uh, of the dictation and so on and so forth. But with the built-in speech recognition engine, then that's, that's not possible. So what happens is um, it's more of a case of as you use it, it learns uh, how you speak and becomes more accurate. But at first, it's really not very accurate. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of kind of getting up to speed. So because of that, it's not as convenient. Um, you can train it to learn the sound of your voice better uh, through an actual series of kind of train, training readings where you just speak to it. But you have to read those off of the screen and then speak them into the microphone. That might not be so accessible to people uh, with vision loss. But the big benefit to the speech recognition service is you can use it for control as well as dictation. And by that, I mean you can use it to perform the functions of certain programs uh, without having to use the keyboard. Let's see if we can uh, try this out here. So we'll, we'll go across to our Word document again. Oops, that's it. Here we go. Okay. 
And to find this, uh, the speech recognition service, I'll just hit Windows and type in speech here. And we'll see there'll be a little speech recognition control bar that opens at the top of the screen. Uh, the first time that you use this, I think you have to do some slight setup in terms of um, just speaking a sentence to set the microphone levels. Uh, but then after that, um, it's really easy to get it going. Like I said, you can do some specific trainings with it. Otherwise, as you use it, it should get better. Now, I haven't trained this one at all to the sound of my voice, so we might find the accuracy is quite poor at the moment. But uh, let's go ahead and give it a try here. We can either tell it to start listening with our voice or we can press on the circular microphone icon to get it to start listening. So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay. Hello, my name is Luke, comma, and I am having a very nice day, period. All right, so I dictated that same sentence. It took a second to turn on there. Sometimes it does. Uh, but let's see what we got. Hello, my name is Luke, and I am a hobby or very nice day. Not exactly what we said. And this is what I was saying in terms of the accuracy. It did an OK job, but obviously that's not going to cut it uh, really. So um, it is a case with this one of really getting it uh, trained up. But as I'd said, this one does, does have the advantages of being able to control things. So, for example, in Word, there's commands that we can use uh, to uh, you know, control the functions of Word. Let's give some of those a try. Uh, I may have some trouble because it doesn't always understand my accent, unfortunately. Uh, but let's see what we can do. I'm going to try and select the text here with the command select all. Select all. And there we go, it went ahead and selected all of that text for us, which was nice. Let's uh, move the cursor to the end of the page with move to the end of the document. Move to the end of the document. And it went ahead and moved the cursor there to the end. Let's move to the start of the document. Move to the beginning of the document. And it moved our cursor to the beginning. Let's try saying, uh, what's else? well, okay, you get the idea of how that works. And there's a number of different commands we can use to uh, control uh, any program um, within, our, within Windows. We can also open programs by saying open and the name of the program and that type of thing as well, which is all very useful. The other thing we can do, which I really like, is we can actually control things by saying press followed by a key uh, a key command. So if we know keyboard shortcuts, we can simulate those with our voice. For example, I know Control A selects text. So I'm going to try saying press Control A, and it should select all of the text. Press Control A. And we can see that that has worked. It's selected the text. Let's try deleting that text. Press delete. That has worked. And I know that undo is control Z. So let's see if we can undo that action. Press control Z. Press control Z. Press control Z. OK, and as you can see, I had some trouble with that one understanding uh, my voice. But that would work for undoing. So any keyboard shortcuts that we know, we can just simulate them by saying press and then the keyboard shortcut. And I think this makes uh, that makes this form of speech recognition quite flexible as long as you can get over that initial hump. And I think if you do have an American accent, it would probably work a little easier. Um, like I say, sometimes it has trouble with my voice. Let's move back to our PowerPoint here. Um, just quickly here, because I see we're running out of time a little bit, but uh, we'll talk about Cortana now. Cortana is a digital assistant built into Windows 10. It's another uh, form of speech uh, 
recognition and speech control uh, that we have. She's basically a digital assistant. Now, the idea initially was that she would be a competitor for the Google Assistant and for Siri and so on and so forth, but actually it didn't work out like that. And Microsoft decided to strip a lot of the cool functionality out, unfortunately, and make Cortana more of a business uh, assistant. And so there's a lot of stuff you can't do with Cortana if you have the 2004 update. Um, but you can do certain things, internet searches, create reminders and lists, check your schedule, uh, open certain settings on the computer, open programs, and so on and so forth. And there is a link here at the bottom to a website which has got a good list of the things you're able to do with her. To activate her, you can set it so that you can use the keyword Cortana or press Windows C and she'll come up and then you can ask her to do what you want. Let me just show you one thing here. Um, I'll ask her to check my schedule. Check my schedule. Ooh, not quite sure what happened there. Let's try that again. Check my schedule. You don't have anything scheduled for today. Okay, so I have nothing scheduled. Let's uh, see if we can create something. Create a reminder. Sure thing. What should I remind you about? A webinar. Okay, when would you like to be reminded? Today at one o'clock. Got it. I'll remind you today, 1 p.m. So she's gone ahead and created uh, a reminder. Now, those reminders are located actually on a website, which is called Microsoft To Do. And it's a little bit weird, but when we create uh, reminders and appointments and, and that type of thing with Cortana, they are synced up to this specific website where we can basically view our, uh, you know, our lists and our calendar appointments and our tasks and uh, flagged emails and things like that. So it's an area where um, we can basically get organized and, and it's specifically synced up to Cortana. And last but not least, we're on the, basically the final slide here. I did want to mention this, although most people are probably already aware of it, but another feature we have to magnify some content uh, is control and plus or pinch and reverse pinch gestures on the touchpad if you're using a laptop. And this is particularly useful on the internet because of the way that web pages are formatted these days. So let's go ahead and move to our internet page here. And we'll go back to that same tab we had before with the new story on it. Now, I have a laptop here, so I'm going to use the reverse pinch gesture and it will magnify this web page for me. And the great thing about it is as it magnifies, no matter how large the text gets, it will wrap it to the width of the screen. If we magnify with the magnifier, then we zoom in, but we have to pan from left to right and up and down as we read. If we zoom in like this, then we don't have to pan from left to right because it will wrap the, the, uh, the text to the width of the screen. So all we have to do is uh, kind of pan up and down, which is a really great way of reading websites. Most websites are responsive like this these days, not all of them, uh, but most of them are. So I would definitely recommend that as a first kind of step for people who want to be able to magnify their web pages. And with that, we have reached the end of the webinar. Thank you all for listening. I do want to just give a quick plug uh, for our YouTube channel where we have assistive technology videos. We have a bunch on Windows accessibility as well as Apple accessibility and a lot of um, demonstrations of assistive technology devices. We release, release new videos every Friday. So if you're interested in that stuff, I would uh, recommend going to take a look at that at youtube.com forward slash in focus technology and if anyone has any questions then feel free to uh, ask those now if they haven't already been answered the exit word for today is going to be gate that's g-a-t-e-s Okay, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions. So thank you all for attending and you will be receiving a copy of this webinar. And uh, also you will be receiving um, the 
questionnaire uh, in about 24 hours. So do keep an eye out for that. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, thank you for attending. And uh, yeah, I will see you hopefully all in the next webinar.